that I have nothing against theory at all. In fact, I've been at Caltech for 25 years, and one of the most pleasurable things for me is Monday lunch. Every Monday, I meet the theory postdocs. It's been a long tradition, um, even when Ramesh was around. And I asked them what they have done in the last week and what new things. Uh, and uh, I learn, and they learn, because uh, I tell them never to make g equals c equals 1, because those are not real units. Uh, and force them to actually compute uh, detection limits. So uh, I hope the young students didn't misunderstand the message. For me as a scientist, what's most important is to get some things done. I don't care uh, what it is. If you are a great theorist, uh, you invented a new theory of GR, uh, good for you. Um, but uh, if not, you should do something uh, that is real. Um, a month later, you should have something. Three months later, more. A few years later, you should have outstanding results. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, wasting time. So for me, there's a certain very finite sense of life that's so important that achievements on a short time scales. And that's what I was saying about theory yesterday, is that mere things like elegance can't be the main driver. In the end, it is stuff you learned, uh, something real that others care about. Uh, OK, so hopefully this is all clarified, and uh, you guys aren't uh, uh, so if you want to quantize gravity, please do. But then you better do it uh, in in few few months, few years, and that's it. Um, okay. So today I'll talk about uh, uh, something which I think is going to happen in the next five. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's see. I need to share this. Just a minute, let me shut off my Skype, otherwise we'll get too many. Because I do a lot of business by Skype, and as these guys come on, they'll start calling me, so which I don't think we want to have now. OK, so I want to talk about uh, 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 I want to talk about uh, uh, what uh, many astronomers regard in this decade. The, that it will be the flowering of transient object astronomy things. And one of the reasons this is happening is that the sky is actually quite well surveyed in many bands. So it makes no, no sense to go and look at it again, because uh, we already have a sky survey. So as uh, Professor Agarwal pointed out, that uh, even a simple thing like uh, the PCA, uh, it's a old, very old instrument, I mean the methodology, just by looking at the galactic plane every day, you find new things. And the whole discovery of accreting millisecond pulsar was done with this very ancient methodology. And why? Because you had that on the sky. Okay? And this is a big difference in astronomy and physics. It's, uh, you have to be there on the sky to find things. Mostly it is uh, little, little things. But once in a while, you get something really great. OK, so that's the reason why in the next decade, there's a strong sense by astronomers that repeatedly looking at the sky is the way to go and discover transits. So, OK, um, I'll, I'll skip this because I did this. So, uh, you know, and then there's this, we did, had a brief discussion yesterday. There's a, uh, when you look at the kinds of large projects happening, then you say, what can India do? Because uh, you look at something like ALMA, that's uh, the world's largest ground-based project. It's uh, excess of a billion dollars. Uh, you look at James Webb, uh, it's now achieved a burn rate of, I think, it's a burn rate of a million dollars a day at this point. Uh, and uh, with the launch of 2017, so you can start uh, integrating that little integral and find out how much it's going to cost. Uh, extremely large telescopes, that are another billion dollar plus mission, so on and so forth. The whole investment in, in gravitational wave observatory has exceeded a billion. LSST, seems they claim it's about a half a billion, but by the time it's done, it is a billion. Uh, LISA, who knows, uh, several billion. Square kilometer array, unpriced. OK, so if you look at this, you'd say, well, astronomy is becoming you know, very expensive, and uh, is that the way to go? Uh, yeah, it's, sometimes it's inevitable. But I want to sh uh, share something with you which you don't have to do such large projects, which is still very exciting. And I call this as a little bit of a sideways revolution. And I'll illustrate with a real example. So here's the Palom Observatory, which I spoke briefly yesterday. And uh, the, uh, the telescope, uh, the centerpiece is the 200-inch telescope, uh, which was uh, funded just uh, before the great crash of 1929 
but actually came to light uh, a bit over 61 years ago, the first light. So this, this observatory is about 60 years old, uh, 61 years old. Uh, uh, this is no longer the world's largest telescope. I forget where the ranking is. It's now considered a mid-sized telescope in, in the way, in the US anyway. And then you have these other small telescopes, uh, the 48 inch, which are described, 16 inch, which was for students. So you have an aging thing, and you say, well, what can we do? Uh, are there things we can compete with these large things? And more, more than the word competition would suggest there's a single goal, is can we do something that is very interesting science? You, know, you write a paper, and it's fantastic. You learn something you know, that others were interested. Uh, and, do we, and if it's a billion dollars, well, that's a very different game. Uh, and uh, so a few years ago, I've been, uh, been thinking about this. So the sideways uh, approach is, that uh, people have been for a long time have used these telescopes singly. That is, use the tel this telescope for a few nights to do something, this one to do something else, this one to do something else. But the idea of actually linking them up, uh, it sounds obvious. Uh, and like many other things, the, most ideas are obvious actually, but uh, the difficulty usually is in making it happen. So I'm describing a project by which we took this old facility in a sense and created a powerful new facility by just linking them up. So we analyze, the, we, we use this to, uh, it's like a discovery engine. We survey the sky with this, find new objects, send the, analyze the data in real time, send it to the, uh, this telescope, which will then do some modest characterization. And if it looks very interesting, send it over here to do spectroscopy. And uh, this machine is so powerful that within its first year, in, it has found more supernovae than the rest of the world put together. Um, and when you start doing things like that, you'll, it'll be, it's inevitable. This is the fun thing on astronomy. Uh, when you start doing large volume like that, you'll always make discoveries, despite yourself, many times. Okay, so uh, I will motivate this by, so I sort of gave you what I'd consider as a strategic view. You know, this is like, a, in some sense, a business plan. I told you, why is this more different, and where do you think I can get? But let me give you the science plan. And uh, you, if you think this is sort of a bit weird, I give the business plan first and the science plan, I'd say it's perfectly right. Uh, you know, for me, science and uh, ordinary life are exactly the same thing. Uh, and uh, uh, you can always figure out the science. That's the easy part. The business plan is the much, much harder part, actually. Uh, so, um, uh, so here's uh, uh, the main reason to, that this uh, project was conceived is to understand transients in the nearby universe. Uh, which I'll show you is a very important problem in astronomy. Uh, then I'll describe the project itself, uh, some results, and then I'll share some ideas of, of, of the future. Okay, so when I say that local universe, I mean transients within about 100 to a few hundred megaparsecs, okay, of that order, not cosmological distances. And you'd say, why is that interesting? Because it's clear, you know, if you look at gamma ray bursts, which I spoke briefly yesterday at high redshift, you can do... And that's, they're all very important. There's, uh, there's, again, there's no value judgment here. But the transients in the local universe affect uh, in the new fields in astronomy. So uh, what are these fields? One is ultra-high-energy cosmic rays. So we now know there are existence of cosmic rays with energies of 10 to the 21 electron, electron volts. And uh, um, these cosmic rays have a natural horizon. So you have this... Uh, 10 to the 21, let's say, we'll, let's assume it's a proton for the time being, uh, a cosmic ray coming towards you. Um, I want all students to very quickly compute the Lorentz factor for this. And then uh, it, uh, this photon, a proton, is now hurtling through that. There's a cosmic background radiation. There are 400 uh, photons, roughly in the 10 milli electron volt range. Again, I, if you're really good, you'd have to compute that right away. And uh, then there's going to be inverse Compton scattering, except at this point, the, the CMB photons are, are now boosted to 200 MeV by the time you do the gamma square, uh, and uh, uh, sorry, gamma, and already, you, instead of just getting an, a simple uh, inverse Compton scattering, you actually get a, a, f, a proton, a, for, a, a, for, a pion production, and therefore this cosmic ray, in fact, starts losing energy, and that's called the GZK cutoff after the people who thought about it first. And uh, this gives you a natural horizon, which depends on the energy scale, and the horizon uh, makes only the local universe important. Uh, similar sort of things apply to high-energy neutrinos, though they haven't been discovered. Uh, same to uh, TeV sources. In this case, if you go to high, sufficiently high energies, you get uh, photon-photon uh, 
interaction itself acting as an optical uh, opacity. Uh, but perhaps the most important thing, I think, is really gravitational wave astronomy, which I briefly mentioned yesterday is uh, the laser interferometer, the gravitational wave observatories which are coming on, and they roughly operate in the 100 hertz band because their main source that they're looking for and they're sensitive, the band is about 100 hertz, is the coalescence of neutron stars, which we know does take place. There are many details we don't know, but we do know a reasonable rate. And uh, unless you really think our understanding of GR is wrong, this should be a signal that is detectable. OK, so what is common about all this is that either due to sensitivity, as in the case of uh, advanced LIGO or Virgo, uh, or due to natural optical depth reasons, the only re region of interest, uh, universe that matters is this 100 megaparsec volume. Um, most of these detectors do not have very high uh, angular resolution. So the electromagnetic, by which I mean the photon counterpart, is really absolutely essential. And we discussed a bit about of that for gravitational wave source. Uh, then the next one is a bit more astronomical phenomena, which is are there transients in the NOVA and supernova gap? So let me explain that. So this is a diagram I'll be using uh, um, uh, frequently. On one axis is the time scale of the phenomena. Uh, it sometimes is the rise time, sometimes the decay time, depending on which particular object you're looking at, because each subfield has their own way of defining a time scale. So you can just regard it as some sort of a characteristic time. And then this is the peak luminosity. As I mentioned, um, uh, the, uh, this is in magnitude units, uh, which is basically uh, something that astronomers devise to keep the physicists out of this game, because uh, uh, physicists are generally bright guys. We don't want them to come and do this uh, sort of easy stuff. But uh, let me let on the secret to the students. It's minus 2.5 log plus a constant. Uh, uh, that's what it is. So the more negative it is, the, the higher the, the, the luminosity. So in this diagram, there are, uh, uh, you have the supernif 1A. I'm looking what I'd consider as naked explosions, by which I mean the ones which without large envelopes around them. So 1A supernovae, in some sense, are the simplest uh, supernovae uh, to, to study, uh, <clears throat> and then the novae. And okay, when you see something like this, there's a huge, huge gap here of the order of 10 to the 4. Uh, let's see, of the order of uh, um, about, uh, let's see, about ninth magnitude here and about minus 18, so 9 magnitudes times 0.4, of the order of about uh, 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4, there's a big gap. Um, you know, uh, this gap, uh, the, the, it's, you can do a psychological test. Uh, you, you show a picture like this to a physicist, and the, immediately the, uh, the genuine physicist will say there's some hidden parameter here, which can only assume one of two values. That's why you have this one group here, and uh, there's another group here. That's, uh, it's a conserved quantity. Okay? That's, that's exactly how the, a good physicist will be thinking. Okay, which is the wrong answer in this case. And almost the way a good physicist thinks is almost always the wrong answer in astronomy. Okay, uh, the right answer is uh, you look at this, which is astronomy, and say, you know what? What do I do to go and discover something here, 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 here? How do I make all these discoveries? Because astronomy is like uh, studying uh, natural universe. You have to go and make discoveries. Um, and uh, the p idea of PTF was, in fact, to go and seek any beasts that lie here find out their rate of occurrence, uh, then find out their origin, and so on and so forth. And I can tell you that already we have started populating this. This diagram, in fact, was only uh, about five years, uh, five years ago when I uh, first made this diagram. And there are very few outliers here. And within a few years, not just our own work, the rest of work by the world, we are actually now seeing new, new animals come up in this zoo. OK, but I, uh, one should give credit to, I think, in my opinion, the greatest astronomer uh, of the last century was, uh, was Fritz Zwicky. Uh, and if some of you don't know him, it tells you a, a lesson as well. Uh, Zwicky was, I think, the most brilliant, most original uh, astronomer. But he was also not like the most diplomatic guy. So uh, it tells you there's, a, there's something you should learn from this. Uh, but he didn't care because uh, Zwicky was Zwicky. Uh, yeah, he made many, many contributions, including along with Juan Carman. He's one of the fathers of the, what he call is a modern jet engine, uh, for example. Um, but I think that his greatest, uh, he started the field of supernovae. The idea of supernovae and novae did not exist. Zwicky understood uh, the importance of approaching astronomical research 
uh, with a fierceness and with a methodology to go and make discoveries. Um, he had some ideas about how the whole philosophy of discoveries, which is actually worth reading. It's a bit slightly crazy book, but uh, the guy was absolutely original. But I would say one of Zwicky's greatest contribution, uh, which I frequently use around in my own department, uh, is his uh, views of some people. He invented, I think, a, an insult which I think is very elegant, uh, so all of you should like it, uh, as well as a very powerful. So if you really don't like someone, you should say, you know, he's a spherical bastard. Okay? In, and the, so I hope you understand why that's so powerful. It certainly it means because no matter which angle you look at the guy, he's a bastard. Okay, okay. So it's an, I'm sure you may forget my talk, but you learned something already. Okay, so of this, I uh, uh, within a few years we already added new beasts. We added a, a new thing called luminous red novae, for which, in fact, just in the last one month, we may even understand the origin of these things, uh, <clears throat> and. Uh, um, uh, a new group here, which uh, doesn't have yet uh, a name. And uh, uh, so already we have uh, two sorts of things. Uh, these are, in some sense, not necessarily all that unknown. But these two are actually two new groups that have been added only in the last two, two years. And this, uh, uh, this in fact, is, uh, is an amazing explanation that came out, per, or an amazing observation that may even explain uh, this particular group here. Uh, but let me concentrate where I think, in fact, uh, the, the region of phase space that I think is very, very important. Um, and that is the, the gap region. So what's shown here is a very is not a cartoon simulation, but this from Eupert and Yanka of a neutron star being tightly ripped apart by a black hole. Um, the simulations start off assuming that they're already the tidal forces are very large. And what's happening here is that um, uh, most of the the material on this neutron star will in fact end up onto the black hole. But what I've, let's concentrate, as you go along, we'll concentrate on the stuff that's outside here. There's a small fraction, small amount. It may be as small as 10.01 solar masses or even 0.1. It's very hard for numerical simulations to handle both material flow very close to the black hole, which is relativistic, and, and the flow which we are interested, which is actually stuff that escapes to infinity. Okay, but even if you have something as small as 0.01 solar masses, uh, the optical depth on, and that is sufficiently large that uh, this uh, mini supernova term that, uh, um, that uh, Pechinsky suggested, uh, in fact, can shine for many hours. And that's the reason I showed you this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, the exploring the sky in less than a day. And, uh, and in the luminosity range between novae and supernovae is uh, where you might expect to see the aftermath of a black hole neutron star coalescence or even a neutron star neutron star coalescence. And that's important because the gravitational wave detection itself, great while it will be, there's no question, it will be a huge thing to celebrate. Uh, and it will be an amazing experimental feat. It will be a verification of something, uh, of an elegant theory. But to figure out where it is, get the energy scale, all those sorts of uh, uh, details, you really need something else, which is non-gravitational. And this is the reason why there's some excitement that LIGO events will be accompanied by electromagnetic signals that may last a few hours on very general considerations. And this is what's driving a large amount of uh, this work that we are working on. Um, OK. so. Um, uh, you can now uh, take these ideas and go back to this phase space diagram. Uh, and uh, 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 you, this is the original classical novae, uh, the 1A supernovae. Uh, then we have this luminous red novae. I'll, I'll return back to that as just showing you as, as an example of something. In real time, we more or less understood what this is. And then um, you, uh, 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 you have uh, uh, sources which should exist. Uh, what's a tidal disruption flare is? Uh, you, uh, Professor Agrawal talked about AGN. Uh, in the center of many of these large galaxies, you have massive black holes. And once in a while, a poor star strays into um, the capture region of this black hole. It's tidally ripped apart. It accretes. So that, that's a tidal disruption flare. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I talked of the short, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the macro novae are the ones I showed you a picture where you have this uh, the coalescence. Uh, you get a small, uh, brief-lived mini supernova. That's a macronova. Uh, a, a fallback supernova is you have a large star. It does its usual stuff. 
It has a very large iron core, which then uh, implodes to form a black hole. But you don't know where the shock wave, how much of the, the material falls onto the back or is advected by the newly form, forming black hole. So we really don't know the luminosity. If most of, it's, most of the nickel is advected, it will be very hard to find. But, it'll be very, but we know the time scales to look for these things on, again, general grounds, uh, GRB afterglows. Um, and uh, so, and uh, point 1A would be the equivalent, that is, uh, you have uh, um, neutron star, neutron star, they'll coalesce, uh, form a black hole, that's a form, uh, the basic model for short heart burst. But what if you have two uh, white dwarfs? And in fact, this is a very rich field because uh, unlike neutron stars, which you know, have a rather limited mass range, you can, the white dwarfs can be 0.6 solar mass and 0.2, and they can coalesce. We, we see such objects which will coalesce. It's in fact quite common. And so one of the ideas for such coalescing uh, white dwarfs is a so-called 0.1a supernova model. So these are ideas. They look, they're all reasonable. And, and in this business, the idea is how, which of them, which, how much does nature make? What is the occupation index of these uh, beasts in the zoo? And uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, sitting in your room and figuring it out is not the option. Uh, even though Eddington, great he was, he really, I think, uh, 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 in his book, he had this idea that uh, if you sit down and think hard enough, you can figure out the universe. Um, I, f well, first of all, it's wrong. And secondly, I think it's arrogant, actually. Uh, OK. So uh, uh, the, uh, hopefully I've now motivated you why, in fact, just looking at these uh, nearby objects and filling the phase space or exploring the phase space is important. And that was the purpose of this, uh, of this uh, uh, project. Uh, so we went from uh, concept to first light in 26 months. Uh, as I told you, for, at least for me personally, uh, life has to be lived incredibly intensely. And, uh, and uh, anything beyond that sort of time scale uh, I would feel like I'm not getting things done. Anyway, so I'm very happy in 26 months, uh, we already started working. Um, and uh, it's based on these two telescopes at Paloma, the 48 inch, which has a, uh, uh, a eight square degree mosaic camera. And this is a 16 inch, which has a simple CCD photometer. Uh, this is a highly robotic operation. There is no person looking at these telescopes at all. Um, and it's not really as simple as you think it is, because uh, the part that's easy to roboticize is you can build weather stations. Uh, is, uh, is it clear? Why don't you open up? The hardest part is sequencing. Uh, how to run something without um, uh, w uh, making the list of what you want to do. Now, in these large observatories, if you go to like Hubble and so on, you know, they have like, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't want to say thousands of people. They have tens of people whose job is to sequence these things. Uh, so it doesn't do something crazy, it's optimized and so on. I can tell you this is one of our great contributions. So we have built sequences for this uh, because there are very bright grad students working on this, which are, uh, have a lifetime of months, okay? That is for months you don't have to attend to this business. And the efficiency is, is reasonably high on, on the sequencing. So that's all been done. And that's why you have all these uh, very bright young people um, and uh, each of them gets some real job. Uh, there's a camera scientist. Uh, most of these are grad students, you know, then uh, they have to figure out all the, if the CCD camera doesn't work, then they have to go talk to the engineers, and I tell them, if you don't understand, you know, there's nothing hard about any of these things, right? I mean, uh, it's all a question of if you're reasonably bright, you should be able to figure out what others have invented. So all these guys, uh, uh, this machine runs, it's a, it's a very large uh, throughput, you'll soon be uh, quite impressed with the amount of data this thing produces. Um, for those astronomers uh, in the audience, uh, this tells you roughly the, the performance uh, of, uh, of the machine. Uh, we take 60 second exposures, Phi Sigma is 21 in uh, G and R band. And here's a picture. So this is a mosaic, it has 12 CCDs. Uh, one of the CCDs, unfortunately, is dead. Uh, and uh, uh, this is about eight square degrees, which is a reasonable amount of sky. And uh, if you zoom in, uh, you can, in fact, see excellent uh, 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 image quality on this. OK, now, even though we built this machine for uh, trans, uh, tr transient work, where we are only looking for things which change dramatically, uh, we did not anticipate it. The engineering specs on this uh, did not only call for 1% of uh, precision. But it turns out we, in fact, can achieve 0.3 uh, uh, millimagnitudes. That is 3 times 10 to the minus 3, 0.3% uh, uh, precision. And that has actually opened up entirely new paths of invest or new key projects. We, in fact, uh, 
one of the projects now is in fact to look at random M dwarfs and to find uh, eclipsing uh, planets through this, uh, which is a very different approach than, for example, is, is being done uh, with more focused efforts like M Earth and so on. So we'll, our, our things would in fact be, when we do discover, they'll in fact be brighter than any other sample to my knowledge. Okay, but that's not the main purpose here. Uh, this is all a game of software. Um, you know, a uh, long time ago, astronomers uh, uh, always thought, you know, if you build a telescope, you always computed how much the telescope was the capital cost, okay? Uh, the, making the glass was the most expensive thing, then making the dome was the next thing, then the mount structure and so on. Um, and about uh, 20 years ago, I think astronomers had a rude shock with a project called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. The original cost of this, uh, very, as it turned out later to be a very successful project, was original estimated cost was $18 million. Uh, they got their digits right. It's just the, the ordering was wrong because by the time it finished, it was $81 million. And uh, uh, the, why was, was such a cost overrun is that many astronomers thought, oh, well, you know, um, the software over the weekend, you know, I, of course, I know Fortran 4, so I can sit down and do some programming. Uh, this business has turned out to be the other way around. In, this, in the Sloan project is where astronomers learned where, in fact, in these projects like this, software cost entirely dominates the cost of the project. Entirely dominates the cost of the project uh, in, in ways that, uh, uh, that we are only slowly coming to appreciate. So uh, uh, when I put this uh, project together, uh, you know, uh, the way it works is you have an idea, you call up people, you say, hey, I want to throw in some money, we'll make this happen. I made sure that I paid nothing for software. It's so priceless, you'd never want to pay. Because once you pay for software, uh, it's total bankruptcy. So all these various teams had to write all the software packages and maintain them. So we have two software pipelines. We have image subtraction pipeline, which runs in real time. Data comes in, it, can, uh, it starts looking for transients right away. And then a more archival pipeline, which actually does a more careful reduction sort of the archive quality uh, you know, high, it's high fidelity photometry and astrometry, and that's sort of called the image and catalog pipeline. Um, <clears throat> and in addition, of course, I told you this whole, the, the whole robotic operations, the sequencer uh, uh, themselves are amazingly long, uh, amazing amount of software that's gone into this. Um, the uh, image subtraction pipeline uh, is run out of LBL um, and uh, is led by Peter Nugent. Uh, in a single night, if you just go and say, okay, I, I got a new image of eight square degrees, then you go and fetch the old image you had, you subtract. And it's not as simple as just doing a matrix subtraction. There's a lot of uh, details which I'm skipping through. But let's say we all do that. In the, you'll find typically in a night, you'll get a million, you know, three sigma events or, or brighter. Uh, most of them are fake. Uh, they are cosmic rays, they're imperfect subtraction. Uh, the hot pixels, all sorts of things. So those things you start understanding uh, or while, you, you start programming, you start filtering. But in the end, you still have, at the end of the night, you still have a few thousand which actually have passed all the statistical tests. Uh, all the systematics have been eliminated, and you haven't discovered a few thousand. There's still lots of them are fakes. So um, this is, turns out to be, uh, this is a problem of classification as which of them are genuine. And this, program, this, uh, this pipeline is led by Josh Bloom uh, of UC Berkeley. And uh, so for, in the beginning, we did uh, basically human wedding. So we all used to look at the data. After a while, you can train people, uh, and they can say, yeah, you know, that's real, and, uh, and that's not. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, you know, it becomes tedious because this is sort of stuff. So we, in fact, our friends at Oxford uh, came up with something called the, uh, the Supernova Zoo. They had a project, it's called crowdsourcing. Basically, crowdsourcing is getting other people to work for you for free, okay? And uh, it's sometimes also called citizen science. So you actually put up the uh, data you want analyzed, and then, believe it or not, there are a large number of people interested in science, although they come back from work, they will actually do this work for you. So this was demonstrated with galaxy classification, you know, spiral versus not spiral, or rotating which way, and so on. So they use the same software setup uh, to get the, uh, the public to, cl to, to say which is a real transient or, or not. Uh, but meanwhile, of course, our goal is to get, uh, you know, make the machines do it themselves. So uh, I don't know whether you guys saw there's a big con 
competition with Netflix uh, recently, the million dollar prize. This sort of a similar thing. We didn't have the money to offer anything, so we're doing rather slowly on our own is, is uh, by using the human classification, can we teach our machine algorithm to actually do what humans do? Uh, we almost achieved that. So uh, Josh's uh, machine waiting thing is almost running at, at good speed. It's not still perfect. Uh, and anyway, this is a, a huge amount of software again um, uh, that, uh, that had to be done. Uh, the IPAC uh, image and uh, catalog pipeline, this led by Jason Sures, and uh, this machine produces a huge amount of data. It's uh, 100 terabyte per year, um, and the catalog is uh, 10 to the 12 sources. It's not like the 10 to the 12 sources we find, but we are looking at the sky repeatedly. So when I say a source, I mean a particular epoch, array, and deck. Um, this by far is one of the largest catalogs that's happening actually in astronomy now. Okay, so hopefully you understood that uh, the telescopes may look uh, very romantic and so on, but the real difficulty and real action lies in the software here. Okay, uh, so the way this uh, thing is structured is like an experiment. You know, we have a, uh, we spend about half the time looking sort of leisurely over the sky over five days. The other um, half of the time, you know, doing more experimental stuff is saying, are there things that, you know, change in the, on time scale of 10 minutes? Well, then we can organize an experiment. We look at on field 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, come back again and do this for the whole night, and then go and find if there's something interesting. And once you have data sets like this, there's like a huge number of key projects. So the students who actually did this work, each of them, they get a reward. They can get to choose a key project they're interested. They're the bosses of those things. So if someone is finding an AM Canvan star, the student who did that hard work and was uh, a reward is, yeah, any AM Canvan, you get it. It all actually works out quite well. Um, okay, so the haul to date, I last I checked a, few, uh, a week ago, was 923 spectroscopically confirmed transients. Uh, that is, we actually have uh, uh, gone for transients alone and said what they are. Okay, the, uh, if you may or may not be impressed, but this is a very large number. I can assure you on that. Okay, so let's look. It's just briefly a few results. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, um, you know, uh, yesterday that uh, the pro project right now is in a very uh, productive phase. Uh, uh, pretty much you can get up in the morning, uh, these machines would have worked for you during the night, and you can look at the data, and this would be something of the order of uh, typically 20 to 40 transients. Uh, mostly it'll be like the before, you know, mostly it'll be the, it'll be one A's, a few twos, a few super new one BC, some nearby things, it is, but mostly we are after this. These other things lead to statistical studies, but this leads to the fun part, and you're, because you're hoping to discover something new. So I'll give you a mix of both of these things. So first, let me start off with a shock breakout. So a shock breakout, what happens is uh, you have a star. Uh, there's some explosion. There is a strong shock wave. Let's not worry how, what is the origin of the shock wave. It comes out. And so what's happening with this shock wave is that as it's uh, moving inside the star, um, the sh uh, the, this, these are very, very strong shocks. So they can heat up the matter, uh, but the photons can't escape. Okay, so. There's a nice equilibrium. Uh, it may, this is entirely dominated by photons, but they can't escape, so the photon pressure itself dries the shock, um, and uh, the heat up the matter, photons are produced, push matter. So there's an interchange of this energy, but it, the, you won't see anything until you come to the very outer layer. And for the first time, okay, when the optical depth is C or V, where V is the shock speed, the photons can start escaping, and that's called the shock breakout. Okay? So if, you, if a supernova did nothing else, that's all you'd see. You'd see a, a shock breakout, and then you'd simply see the cooling radiation from this ball. But supernovae la last a lot longer than that because of radioactivity. So we'll, that's a separate matter. But if you can find that moment when the photons are able to escape for the first time, you have a very direct measure of the radius, it turns out. Okay, um, it'll be, it's very difficult. To, so you can very clearly see that the duration of the shock is simply related to the size of the star. So small stars, you have to be very, very lucky. Uh, they are very sh small durations. But the large stars, you can find. For example, here's the one we found uh, <coughs> with uh, PTF 09DAH. So uh, the designation 09 means to discovered in the year 2009. And we start, it's an astronomy thing. You, know, you start with A, B, C, 3, and you go to Z. 
uh, then uh, it'll become A, 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 B, A, C, and so on. So that's uh, it's, uh, the, one of the things we do. And uh, uh, just a few weeks ago, we actually broke into the four-letter thing. And I'm really anxious. Uh, I really love the four-letter ones uh, because there's some very juicy bursts that, I mean, events, I'm sure it'll be very nice to give some talks on, on those particular four-letter ones. It's meant to be a joke. OK. <laughs> Uh, okay, so anyway, you can see the shock breakout. Um, uh, in fact, this is a supernova. This is the shock breakout, and that's a supernova that's coming up. Okay, this is the part that is uh, that comes up uh, 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 for a different region. Uh, this is sort of the cooling radiation. This is the initial burst, and eventually, if you wait long enough after the cooling radiation decreases, you'd in fact get the radioactive tail in this case. So, uh, but a more spectacular one was. Uh, uh, PTF09UJ, uh, where it so happened the Galax mission was also observing the same piece of sky. So we had both UV and optical data. And in this particular case, the radiation, the, this, uh, the UV light and the optical was very, very bright and uh, lasted a long time. And what happens in this particular case is, uh, is sort of obvious after the fact is, even though I give you a simple picture of a naked star that is explosion, then there's leaking at the very surface, but assume now this star is surrounded by circumstellar matter, and that's not a surprise at all. In fact, the massive, massive stars have a lot of circumstellar matter. So even though you may get the shock breakout, the photons leak out, they're trapped again because the optical depth from the surface into the circumstellar medium is already large. So they're sort of reborn again at a much larger radius, and we discovered this phenomenon. So it turns out that you can, for some of these things, we can even start studying the circumstellar medium uh, around the star through optical techniques. OK, the next one is a supernova uh, for cosmography. As you know, supernovae 1A have been used. You can form Hubble diagrams. You discover supernovae different redshifts. And if you can calibrate them, these are 1A. I won't go into details, but they're calibratable. Then uh, you can look at the apparent magnitude or apparent flux as a function of redshift. And then you fit various uh, cosmographical models, you know, where different uh, omega and lambda, and that's sort of one of the earliest indications that uh, you have uh, uh, a dark energy, in fact, came from the study of such supernovae. Uh, <clears throat> that the distant supernova is slightly dimmer than just uh, or what you would have thought in a, in a, a lambda equals zero universe. However, there's a little bit of a catch because the signal, the difference between the various cosmographical models is largest over here at a redshift of about, let's say, 0.7 or so. You need to go over here to see the difference between these various uh, 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 values of lambda and omega. Uh, at low redshift, they're almost the same. But the problem is that you need to compare these supernovae to the ones over here, right? Because it's a local supernovae is the ones you know uh, in, uh, in physical units, OK? Uh, and uh, so these you study in optical. These also you study in optical, and that's the bad news because what you see here in optical is really ultraviolet rest frame. Okay, so you're really comparing the ultraviolet magnitudes of the supernovae to the optical magnitudes of nearby supernovae. And uh, um, what if it turns out that your eye, that uh, uh, that there is some systematic uh, effect here because the ultraviolet. Uh, part of the spectrum is dominated more by metals, uh, and uh, therefore it could be wrong. So the way to do this is, in fact, to study the nearby guys. There are two ways to do One is you study these in the near-infrared, so you can then do near-infrared to optical. That's much harder because the near-infrared band is very noisy, at least from ground. The other one is you study these in ultraviolet. That sounds pretty straightforward, except to do ultraviolet, you have to be in space. You have to organize this large program. And Hubble, for example, uh, routinely does not react to quick events. So every Thursday, you load up Hubble for things that will happen in the next 10 to 14 days. So what we have done is uh, we have, uh, because we have a now more or less a supernova on demand machine, so about every Tuesday, we get very active for this program. This is a program read by Nugent, Ellis, and others. Uh, and we say, OK, let's go and discard a few 1A for the next few days. And by Thursday, so what we so this is a discover this is a redshift versus the magnitude. If you discover a supernova one at at peak brightness, this is the line. So we are trying to, we are now discovering supernovae T minus 14, 14 days before bright. So then we can load up Hubble. So by the time Hubble observes, they're already at peak peak brightness, and you get an ultraviolet spectrum. Okay. And uh, I'm by nature, as you may have guessed, contrarian. That is my view is that. If most of the world likes something, then by 
definition or by almost compulsion, I have to oppose it. So I kept hoping, you know, I hope this signature of dark energy will go away. I'm, you know, even though I'm an atheist, I would, every night before going to bed, just kneel down, pray to God. I hope, in fact, I'll be the one showing this, this is all wrong. You know, unfortunately, this business survives. Uh, so the ultraviolet spectra, we now have 30 of them, and it turns out uh, the signature for dark energy, this uh, particular small difference, still survived this. And that's why I'm an atheist, because if there's really God, he should have listened to me and helped me out. Okay, so um, once you have large samples, there are various subfamilies, and I don't have the time, nor is it very suitable for this audience. Uh, there are the so-called 2005 E family supernovae. These are supernovae which happen in halos of galaxies. Uh, they're not from young population, and you could argue they're likely, just like short heart bursts, likely, in fact, they are the coalescence of white dwarfs, okay, and uh, uh, of these things which have been shored out or uh, been around for a long time. Um, and uh, we, uh, progress had been slow because only a few, in fact, just two. But uh, we are now discovering one per, per month, and so we're slowly gaining to understand, and hopefully at some point we'll understand the origin of these very uh, halo events. Uh, there's another group called 2002CX family. Again, I don't have time to go into, but there are some ideas that this 2002CX family, in fact, is connected with the birth of black holes. That is, these are the supernovae of black hole things. And uh, we now have a sample of about 40 of these things. And so once you have these samples, you can start making theories and comparing. So these are the kind of statistical studies we can do. Here's another example of statistical studies, which actually is of uh, wider importance. There's a suspicion that uh, the supernovae that are formed, the kinds of supernovae, uh, uh, differ in large galaxies versus small galaxies. And the reason is that the small galaxies, in fact, host uh, uh, much larger stars on an average. That is, it, they host, uh, the so-called initial mass function is different in small galaxies and large galaxies. And our work is already showing some signs. In fact, this is true. That the, if you can see, without going into the details, if you, de if you classify the supernovae in dwarf galaxies and large galaxies, you can see there are already some differences. Uh, so in, in this one paper, we just took 72 supernovae to do this. And you know, even three years ago, taking 72 in one paper would have been like amazing. It would have taken years to do that. The next paper we're writing will have 250 supernovae to see, in fact, if this trend continues. But this should hearten people who are doing, this is of some value for if you want to understand the large-scale formation of uh, galaxies and chemical pot uh, uh, the, the, the spewing of, uh, of metals uh, by supernovae in young galaxies. Okay. Um, for if you, a few years ago, if you went to a, a meeting in supernovae, you know, everyone said, do you know what is SCP-06-F6? This was found by uh, when someone was studying, uh, Barbary et al. was studying, uh, uh, looking for supernovae in the cl nearby clusters, and they found this event which just uh, went up, uh, faded away, and if you looked at the pre- and post-explosion region, there was no, uh, there's no galaxy at all. The shape uh, and the particular absence of a galaxy was remarkable. This is Hubble data, so they're really very deep. So this was always the, like the mysterious SCP-06-F6. Uh, there's one paper, and there are six um, papers giving you, uh, you know, kind of what I call as the cheap theory papers trying to explain this. Uh, of course, all of them wrong because I can, we now know the answer. And, uh, so when I, to, when I made the statement, this sort of business is cheap, is because I can give an observation, and if you're sufficiently imaginative, I think you should be able to write six different ideas on these observations. Uh, that's both the fun and the curse of astronomy, I would say. Okay, so with PTF, we started finding these things. This is led by Robert Quimby, postdoctoral fellow. Uh, we started finding these uh, very interesting, very blue supernovae, which lasted a long time. And Robert was able to put a picture together when he got the spectrum, and this is SCP-06, which had this weird spectrum that no one could understand. But Robert got enough supernovae that you could, in fact, even see the sequence. So this is now arranged by redshift with the lowest redshift here and the highest redshift here. And we now know this SCP-06-F6 is a highly redshifted version of a new class of supernovae, which are luminous supernovae. And I don't have the time to get into here, but we believe that these supernovae are the deaths of very massive stars. Um, and the way they explode is completely different. They, in fact, do not have a core collapse. It's something true. It's called a pair instability. That is, if you, uh, um, if you have a massive enough star, the, the, in the center of the star, uh, the, it's extremely hot, hot enough, the temperature is high enough, that photons can interact with each other and produce electron-positrons, okay? 
uh, just the tail end of the max uh, of the of the Planck distribution has this very high energy uh, uh, photons, which then pair produce. Now there is a problem because you take these two high energy photons and you produce electron positron, which is almost zero uh, re zero kinetic energy. Therefore, suddenly the pressure decreases, right? So as the star is, gets hotter, the pressure decreases, and that's obviously bad news. So the star, in fact, uh, collapses. And uh, we believe that uh, some of the supernovae are these sorts of explosions, uh, pair instability. They were, figured, uh, they were postulated in 67. It only took 40 years to make this uh, connection. OK, now this luminous supernovae, I think, uh, actually, uh, in my opinion, will be a big cordage industry because it has applications b ranging from people like me who like to understand the physics of how stars die to uh, people interested in large-scale structure. Uh, we believe they arise in tiny galaxies, which are very metal poor. So one of the ideas of something like JWST is to go and study the universe at high redshift when the galaxies are very tiny are very metal poor. And one of the most prominent phenomena that happens there is, in fact, these sorts of supernovae. And I like the idea. I really would like to imagine that uh, without doing all this work, we are actually finding small pockets of star formation locally at a redshift of a few tens, which are already metal poor, and making the same sort of supernovae as it happens in the early universe. So this way, we force JWS to do, you know, maybe do some other kinds of more modest science. Uh, but let's see how this will work out. And uh, because this uh, signal is uh, uh, very ultra, it's very blue, you can actually use this as natural beacons, like lighthouses, to see the interstellar medium in the galaxy, the intergalactic medium, because you can see this up to redshift one. So this is what I call as uh, armchair astronomy that uh, becomes possible with these bright objects. OK, uh, so in the last six months, um, I won't go through this, but uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, we found a huge number of eclipsing M dwarfs. So the, Mass radius relation uh, for stars less than the mass of sun. Uh, there are some uh, minor uh, little things to verify in stellar structure, uh, in stellar structure theories. Uh, uh, we've been finding weird pre-main sequence events, so-called FU ORI things. Found an eclipsing binary in Pricipe, which means we can nail down the distance to Pricipe. Getting distances to any nearby star cluster is very, very important because that's when you can do some preci precision comparison. AM can when stars, these are stars which we believe will merge. Uh, uh, these are new two white dwarfs uh, of huge value to the LISA mission. Uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, one of the projects we did is look at Orion. Uh, I love this project because uh, 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 it addresses the issue of the rotational history of stars. So you can look at these stars. Uh, we looked at Orion for one month. Orion rose. We took pictures morning uh, or dusk to dawn. Stopped. Next night, same thing. Next night, same thing. We did this for 40 nights. And we have now nailed down the rotational history of all these things. OK, well, just to give an idea of how this sort of business works. So six months ago, uh, we found uh, uh, this is a thesis program of grad student uh, Mansi Kastliwal. So um, you know, this is the sort of a, 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 a day. A, as soon as you find something, these are all automatically generated. Uh, it's a nearby galaxy, and there you can see, in fact, various people looking at it. So this is a worldwide thing. Uh, this data available to the entire collaboration. So somewhere in August, uh, uh, Mansi said transient, and then she her, her other program kicked in, and she realized it's in a nearby galaxy. And then the robots are these things which are automatic classifiers. And then eventually Derek Fox at Penn, at, uh, Penn State uh, 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 submitted a thing to the HET to observe. So uh, it's sort of a very, for me, this is kind of fun. This is like uh, having this whole world work around. You know? So we get up in the morning, you find someone in Israel has triggered something else. So the speed at which this science is done is amazing. So six months uh, ago is what we found. And uh, then we realized it's an interesting luminous novi. Uh, we put a Spitzer and Hubble request uh, because it's interesting enough. We got this right away. And uh, then two months later, uh, Mansi wrote this paper. So we sat down. And the way we write these papers, we say, yeah, let's uh, figure out what happened. Um, in four hours, the paper gets written, submitted. Uh, now, some of you may think, oh, this is so inelegant. Uh, uh, you really should be like uh, Spartans. You know, the more you suffer, the better it is. Uh, I would say good for you, um, OK? And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, meanwhile, we actually made a discovery. Uh, we are learning something, so good for me. OK, here's a PTF-DEN PHP. Most supernova, this has a rise time of only a few days. 
and the peak luminosity is uh, 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 the, the peak luminosity of this object is in fact you can see here the 1A supernovae these this group here we are now found is in fact extremely subluminous the amount of nickel in this is 0.03 solar masses of nickel in this sort of uh, uh, um, uh, explode and we now believe in fact this is in fact a 0.1A uh, 0.1A um, uh, event. So Lars Bilston, who was one of the proponents of this idea, is, is extremely happy. Okay, um, we're finding blazars, and uh, uh, this, this business uh, uh, turns out to be quite interesting. Uh, we're, in fact, now noticing that when we find some things which, uh, even though this started looking very intriguing here, uh, because it turns out to be a blazar, which is not related to this, so we are now finding that uh, because we have so much data, we can go and look at an object, it's uh, fluctuating, and then we compare that with the Fermi glass catalog, and many times we are finding this hit. So in fact, I would say we have found a way to identify all the faint end of the Fermi glass catalog quite easily. Uh, and uh, again, you may not appreciate it in the field, but the, these are not very well localized sources, and we now have a way by which we can do very large studies on this. So we can even put out a paper at some point which saying identification of you know, thousands of Fermi glass blazers. Okay, so let me end by saying, okay, as you may have gotten, my sense is okay, it's a game. It's a game. It's a whatever. It's a game. It's a business. Whatever you want to say. So I'm trying to figure out what's the next, uh, how will this game change? Uh, what's, uh, how does uh, one prosper? in uh, ever-changing times. So I would say this game will shift into two paths. One is high cadence. You, you look at the fields repeatedly because you're trying to find new phenomena at, at, at small time scales. The other one is high sensitivity. The, the, the one lesson learned is if you can't classify, if you don't know what that object roughly is, it's not very useful. Because in a single night, we can go and discover 30 supernovae. But if I, if, uh, if I didn't know what type it is, then it is of little value because I have to find out which one of them is very interesting. Okay, usually, you know, our monthly rate is in a month, if you by the time you do a few hundred, you get maybe a few, one or two. So it's a, the pickings are slim, so you must have a classification. So I've been thinking of something which I call as the next generation transient facility. You know, the always thing is if you, first I thought we should call it PTF2, but then my students said, you know, if you've seen a movie called Rocky Horror Show 1, it's, I don't think you'll go see Rocky Horror Show 2. So I said, yes, so we'll make it next generation. That's always a permanent, uh, permanent uh, thing. It's always the next generation. And I've changed it from factory to facility because you have to come up with this integrated view. So the first thing that I think is interesting is I showed you this diagram before, but that had cut off at, at one day or you know, a fraction of a day. But there's this whole phase space here. And you have the GRBs here with the non-relativistic transients. And uh, there's this question mark. This is from the LSST book. Uh, I think we can explore this. Uh, we don't have to wait for LSST. In fact, I'd love not to wait for LSST, because uh, the part I love the most is, in fact, to undermine big things. So if we can do this, it'll be wonderful. So, we, uh, so how do you do that? We don't, uh, LSST has an uh, eight uh, meter uh, diameter, so we're going to compensate by building very large focal planes. Right now, the detector we have is only about this size, but if we can get to a thousand square centimeter of silicon, uh, then we can start doing high cadence studies. Uh, <clears throat> so, and that's, there's been a big breakthrough in the last two years is that you can uh, now make uh, from uh, six inch wafers, you can actually make a full CCD with, with many channels. So this is an STA CCD. So uh, we costed this, uh, which we call for PTF2. And for under about maybe $2 million total, we can in fact get all the CCD sensors. And this is a big deal thing because only more than, only a few years ago, this would have been five or six million and beyond the scale at which I can operate. Um, then uh, the postdocs, uh, uh, Nick Konidaris and Robert Quimby, with the collaboration with National uh, Central University of Taiwan, uh, we are building something called the SED machine. Because the main thing you want to do is you want to, find, after you discover something, you want to get a quick spectrum. And you want to know, is it a 1A, which is most likely two-thirds of the time true, not 1A? If so, what are the details? Once you know that, then you can put your energies into, uh, so if you, what I'm saying is if we increase our field of view by a factor of six, then at the end of the night, instead of something like 20, we'll have 120. That's a lot. So uh, we are uh, proposed a thing called a TO telescope. And this is to take one of these uh, two-meter telescopes, uh, uh, put an IFU like the one I showed you, 
And uh, this telescope, uh, so we, we have our machine will be discovering stuff. It sends off a little email request to the other telescope. It'll go get a spectrum. It just loose gets a spectrum. There's no slit alignment, no astronomer or something. Uh, this will be amazing. So by the time you get up, you will actually have the spectra of all the things. Then you'll know what you want to do. Um, you also want to do very precise photometry, and this is a program we have with Ayuka, which we call as Robo AO. Uh, Robo here means a robotic AO system. In fact, we had our first uh, light. It's a Rayleigh scattering UV uh, AO uh, system, and you can see here the engineer Lowell from Ayuka, Sriharsh, and uh, a PI is a uh, postdoc, um, Christopher Barnack, uh, and a programmer, Tim Riddle. Uh, and uh, we hope, in fact, to finish this demonstration by uh, in, in about six months. And uh, so we can then do the light curves uh, in a robotic fashion. Uh, the last thing is we, uh, you know, uh, someone, we had a little discussion. Now, uh, one of the things that's missing here, everyone thinks of ground supporting the space because uh, the space is usually more expensive, that's why. So I say, again, in the view of trying to do everything upside down, why not have space support ground? So. Uh, one of the things that's miss, that we really enjoy a lot right now is the SWIFT mission. The SWIFT mission allows us uh, to, uh, with very little questions asked, to trigger and say, this is very interesting, get the data, and it does it. But, you know, it's only like at most once a week, which is already a lot. But what if you had our own mini satellite? So uh, this is something I've been working for a while. So, um, you know, there is the axis of E that we all heard of. So we have another axis of E, which is an axis of excellence and starts here in India, goes through Israel and to Canada. Um, and the U.S. is conspicuously not here because uh, NASA would mean all sorts of ITAR issues. So uh, there's an informal group of us working away. And, in fact, we have uh, tremendous support from the Israeli Space Agency. And the idea is we'd, in fact, have a small UV satellite which will be entirely under the command and control of uh, this NGTF. We'll find something, we'll say, yeah, go get data on a 20-centimeter UV telescope. Anyway, so um, I think uh, uh, on this uh, rather ambitious note, uh, I'll end this talk. See, uh, hidden in your transient signals, there must be also eclipse due to exoplanets. Yes. Can you detect some of them, or is it? No, no, that's, that is the project I described. Initially, we had not planned to do that because the, the signal of the eclipse is the ratio of the area of the planet divided by the area of the star, so our planet by our star squared, okay? And even for, uh, and, uh, uh, so you, you, even for something like an M dwarf, you need a certain precision, which we thought we were not achieving. But it turned out we, our machine is much better than we had, in some sense, engineered for. So that is a key project that is being pursued by Nick Law in Canada, where he's looking at all nearby M dwarfs, and he constructs his, the data, and he's looking for eclipses. And he has found some, but they're eclipses by, you know, in one case by another M dwarf, in another case by a brown dwarf. But we know the system is working. So if we do find, in fact, these will be more uh, juicy in the sense that uh, other programs, they look explicitly at a low latitude field, uh, like Kepler or M Earth and so on. Whereas our approach is, in fact, we're just looking randomly, and we're always finding the nearest M dwarfs. They are there, whether we like it or not. So in fact, we're hoping this will uh, succeed. I'm just seeking a clarification. Your macronova, where you yeah. showed the neutron star going around the black hole and disintegrating, that is also a tidal disruption. Yes. So what's the difference between that and the tid tidal disruption flares? I mean, uh, exactly. the, the origin of energy. The tidal disruption of star, when people, astronomers mean TDF, they're thinking of a massive black hole, 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 9 solar masses, and a star. And that takes a very long time, because the star uh, uh, this event lasts maybe like a month. The macronova is all over in like, you know, less than a day. Uh, the ultimate source of energy for the shining for macronova is really the radioactive release. Okay, in a tidal disruption case, I don't think uh, nuclear synthesis mostly is not so important. In fact, the classical tidal disruption has no nuclear synthesis. It's just tearing apart of this star 
uh, which is already quite hot. It's radiating. That's so the quite different things. The time scales are very very different. Mass of the black hole involved is much larger. Um, just a question. Um, I've been, you know, in astronomy for a while, and I remember one of the questions that was always debated up to about 10 years ago was the uh, supernova rate in galaxies. Do you have any new wisdom on that? Uh, I don't think we can do the supernova rates uh, as uh, well as, uh, uh, in okay. To do the supernova rates, you really have to understand your experiment really well. And so far, I would say the way we classify things has not been to the point where it's the, we understand which objects, which of the transients we want to actually get the spectrum. Uh, the bias is, I think, not understood very well. So we are not really focusing so much on the precision rates. Um, and, uh, but if we can get to the point of having this uh, TOO telescope so that there's very clear, idea, you know, it's sort of there's no human in the loop, then I think uh, we'll have a very good uh, set of numbers. For this, for this uh, PTF, and the second is what is your, op I mean, and, and then now continuously, what is, what kind of budget do you have operating? Yeah, I, I can tell you that. Uh, the uh, capital cost of, uh, uh, for PTF-1 was about a million dollars, which uh, was uh, getting the CCD doer, refurbishing the telescope, uh, and all that sort of stuff. The running costs about 360K, uh, a year uh, for the whole thing, so it's uh, but uh, so it's by the by the standards of this game, it, this is a uh, dirt cheap experiment. But what I haven't told you is all those. I don't pay any of those people at all. Okay, so that's the that's a real cost. So the software, for example, the whole uh, real time pipeline. This is really run by uh, uh, in effect DOE runs this. We they have dedicated a cluster for us. There's a 24-7 system manager. There's programmers, all these guys. Uh, that's not a part of this business at all. Plan now about linking to these other observatories and seeing coincidences? And uh, we, are, we have an MOU both with LIGO and with uh, IceCube. So in fact, we have a couple of IceCube triggers. So they can, uh, because we have such a large field of view, we are uh, considered very valuable. So uh, those are the, I think, the ones which make the most sense of that, of that group. And I'm hoping when AstroSat goes up that uh, it'll be fruitful both ways. That is, uh, for example, Professor Agarwal talked about AGN. Uh, now, AstroSat is great to the extent you sit on an AGN. For the moment you're sitting on it, to you're not sitting on it. You get all the very detailed multi-band information. But the, his, the, what you call as legacy data is something we can supply. Uh, by the time we finished with the PTF-1 experiment, we'd have looked at any piece of the sky uh, minimum 50 times or a four-year period, and some of them 500 times, depending on uh, where exactly it is in the sky. So already we are doing some of this AGN science by simply finding which sources are varying and then seeing do they lie in a, a Fermi glass catalog. So this sort of, uh, the long time scale can be supplied by us and AstroSat will do the more intensive things. And the, the opposite would be is that AstroSat uh, has this very wide field uh, discovery machines. You know, the ASM on XTE has always been wonderful. It finds something. So we can then, they discover, uh, we can then go and uh, uh, immediately follow. Up. Because the next machine we want to build 40 square degrees, that's quite a lot. One of the modes is we want to do something like 5,000 square degrees a night. At that point, we are pretty much covering, I wouldn't say we're covering the whole sky, but that is a reasonable amount of sky. Yeah. Fermi glass. Sorry. No, no, no. It's, uh, no, no. Fermi glass, G L A S T. Uh, yeah, it's a mission. Well, maybe I, I would like to take one question from the back benches. Again, we have the great mass segregation that's happened uh, today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah.